Welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Radio. I'm your host, Deborah Bailey. And when I started this show in 2008, I was on a mission to promote women-owned businesses and help women succeed by providing resources and valuable tips from other women and men, small business owners. In each interview, my guests speak openly about their triumphs, the scary times, and tough decisions they had to make along the way. Women Entrepreneurs Radio is about showing women how to harness their natural strengths to achieve success on their own terms. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Radio with your hosts, Deborah Bailey and Carrie Heaps. Really glad for you to join us uh, today. And we're um, if you're listening to some automatic, then I hope that you will also subscribe on iTunes. And um, that also may be called Apple Podcast these days. So please make sure you do that. And it would be wonderful if you could share a review. Um, five stars is always wonderful. And that will help the show be um, found by other people as well. And you can come to womenentrepreneursecrets.com. And uh, click on the podcast um, in the menu bar, and then you can find out what other platforms the show is on and uh, also download guidelines if you're interested in being a guest and see different um, other information about the show. So hope that you will do that. And we're going to get started today. We're going to talk about the part two for about sales, and this is going to be referring uh, more to the offline activities with uh, sales so if you haven't listened to the online that was uh, part one and it would have been posted before this show so you can check that out um, also and see what uh, that discussion was if you haven't already so introducing uh, my co-host Carrie Heaps is a publisher of pageant platform magazine and the host of pageant platform podcast She's a founder of Carrie Studio, a full-service pageant training company that offers training to women ages 16 plus all over the world. Her passion is to help women succeed in pageantry, build a successful platform, and use it to build a successful career or business after exiting pageantry. She's a founder of Pitch Like a Bitch Media, an online resource to gain more media exposure, and the author of Pitch Like a Bitch. Top 10 Tips to Pitch Like a Pro, was published in December 2017, and the Create Your Own Media series for podcasting, publishing, and publicity. She has an extensive background in sales, networking, recruiting, and training. She is a former model who specialized in training show and print work. She's also an experienced judge on the pageant, beauty pageant circuit, and you can find her at Pitch Like a Bitch Media, www.pitchlikeabitchmedia.com pageant training at www.carriesstudio.com and pageant platform magazine www.pageantplatformmag.com so welcome back to the show carrie thank you deb as always it's such a great honor to be here with you and just your audience is so awesome and i'm excited about this topic it's one of my favorite topics that i could talk and talk and talk about <laughs> So I will try to make it short for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely wanted uh, to have you on to discuss this because I, I, you know, think it's something that doesn't get talked about as much as other things in business. And, um, you know, really it's a thing that we all uh, should really know much more about and know how to do because otherwise how are you going to get paid? So, um, you know, I think this is really a necessary topic. So, you know, we're going to touch on some similar things that we may have done in the online one, if you've already listened to that. Um, and I think, you know, to start out about setting up a sales process when you are doing the offline thing, you know, what what are your uh, thoughts about that? Well, clearly, online and offline, those are, you know, two very, very different things. Um, it's still the same process in a lot of ways, but 
I think it's vital, you know, vital to your business to at some point you got to shut the computer off, go to some networking events, go out and do some cold calling or pick up the phone and make some phone calls, um, you know, get in front of people physically. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really feel like it changes the dynamics of what you're doing. And I think it keeps us a little bit more on our toes and it keeps us sharp. Mm-hmm. Um You know, sometimes when we're behind our, you know, marketing online, you know, we could be writing all the time. We could be creating products and and just, you know, uh, maybe, you know, something unteachable that we would normally teach in person. And sometimes we get a little bit lax when we do that because we can work at home in our pajamas, no makeup. And, you know, it it just, (laughs) you know, it's a different uh, environment. But when we get out there in person, we've got to we got to bring our A game. You know, people are are seeing us and they're going to see if we're sometimes it's easier to mask when we're yawning or we don't feel good when they don't have to see us. But, you know, when when they see us in person, we really have to uh, bring out our full best and, and, you know, physically present our best. And I I think it just really helps to keep us on our toes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that a lot of people maybe are not really wanting to <laughs> go out there uh, for whatever reason, uh, maybe feel uncomfortable or, or, you know, just kind of afraid to put themselves out there. And it, that's totally understandable. I totally get that. And, you know, it's speaking of teachable, as you know, because you had, um, you know, been one of the people to review my online course. Um, you know, I just launched an online school. Uh, Secrets of Success School for uh, Entrepreneurs, Authors, and Small Business Owners. And you can see links for that on my website, thebaileycoach.com. And what I realized is that since I do um, some in-person workshops, I've done the libraries and things, that this is really a good place for me to put a lot of that content. And also I can refer to that when I'm doing workshops and for people want more information or they want to take one of the courses uh, based on what I'm, you know, presenting to them. that now this is something I can do to get them to another step with me where before I didn't really know how to get them there. You know, maybe I can give out a handout, which I, to be honest with you, a lot of times I didn't have Mm -hmm. because I wasn't thinking about, okay, these are folks I'm presenting to. Right. Maybe I can get them to something else. And I didn't really have that something else. You know, mm-hmm. the, the opportunity came up for me to do this. And I wasn't, I can honestly say I wasn't prepared mm-hmm. with how to get them to a place where now they can learn more about me and perhaps purchase something directly from me as opposed to, you know, um, the, the library presentation. So it really is interesting how I could tie the online and the offline together um, you know, that's something I'm realizing that I really could do. But, you know, how how can you really keep track of these people that you're prospecting? You know? Well, you know, offline, clearly it's a little bit different because, you know, you don't have people filling out your prospecting forms online that, you, you know, mm-hmm. we're going through your funnel. <laughs> it's hard <laughs> to put a physical person through your funnel. Right. However, I think that would make an excellent commercial, very comical, uh, <laughs> putting people through the funnel if you had to do it offline. I mean... That I mean, I could just thing. picture, yeah, like one of those slides from Wet n Wild, you know, from the amusement park where you're trying to filter people through. Yeah. Right. Um, so anyway, you know, when you're marketing offline um, and sell, you know, just prospecting, so to speak. I mean, usually I think people do three main things offline. They're either on the phone. They're out cold calling, like picking a a neighborhood office park or picking the downtown area and just, you know, going from door to door. Or they might be going from door to door in a residential neighborhood or they are attending networking events. Um, So you're going to be collecting information, but in a different way. So let's just take the first one, like networking events. You know, you might go to let's just say you've got three events planned this week. There's two of them that are free that you're going to and the one that you have to pay like 10 bucks for. Mm-hmm. So you go to all three of these events and you're meeting different people at each one because they're on different area, you know, different areas, different topics. 
And uh, let's just say on average, there's about 20 people at each event. And let's just say you talk to about 10 of them and collect 10 business cards at each event of people that you've talked to that could be good prospects for you. So you got 30, 30 business cards at the end of the week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, clearly it's still going to kind of be the same process. You know, you've interacted with them. Um, you've talked with them at each event. One of the things I recommend everybody does is you, whether you do a cold calling in an office, um, you get the person's business card or you get the business card and you write down who's in charge of hiring or, or whatever. Um, at the end of the day, you know, after that event or if it's a nighttime event, do it the next day. Write each one of those people a quick email. Hey, it was great to meet you. Um, I enjoyed chat, you know, whatever you talked about. One of the things I like to do when I collect a business card in person is if I'm talking with the person um, about, let's, and I did this when I worked in staffing, mm -hmm. I would go and I would like, I would do this twice a month where I would pick an office park that had maybe, you know, 200 different offices in it. And I would start at one end and end my week or my day at the end of the other side of it. So I might, you know, leave my information with 50, 60 different companies in one day. But at the end of the week, I probably had about 200. So I should be, I should have at least like 100, 150 business cards. Now, when I'm into it in an office, and it's the same thing when you're meeting somebody one on one, if you start a conversation with them, and let's just say you're at a networking function, and you meet uh, Frankie, and Frankie's a real estate agent. He's new to the business. Oh, Frankie, do you have a card? I'd love to take one. Sure. You know, grab his business card, ask him for his and get his information. And usually on the back, you can jot down notes on their card. And if you're talking with him about and let's just say real estate agents are a good prospect for you. But if you're mm -hmm. talking about um, he's maybe he's new to the business, just write that on the on the back of the card, because don't count on the fact that you're going to remember everything that you talked about with everybody. You don't. Uh, you come home from a networking event. You're busy. You might have kids. The dog needs to be fed. Somebody threw up. You're not going to remember mm -hmm. all of this the next day. Mm -hmm. So jot it down, new to the business, uh, just relocated, whatever details this person gives you, jot it down on the back of the card, because that's only going to help you later when you go to follow up. Let's meet again and talk one on one um, and anything key that they're talking about. Maybe they have children. Maybe you have kids. Maybe their kids are interested in karate and you just uh I don't know, you just signed your kid up for, you know, some karate lessons and you can share that information with them to, you know, to kind of help them. Um, so jot all of that down. When you go back the next day, write everybody a, a quick thank you email or just, you know, just a quick email. Hey, it was great meeting you. I love talking about someone, you know, talking about this and welcome to the area. By the way, here's um, so-and-so's information. They teach karate. Give them my name and you'll get 10% off. You know, make sure that you're having a conversation with them. You, you continue to carry that on. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, include in there, hey, I would love to, you know, if you have time next week, I'd love to meet for coffee one-on-one. -on -one. You know, what works for you Monday or Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Let me know what's best for you. And continue that conversation, especially if they're a good prospect. If it's somebody that, you know, let's just say it's a, if you're marketing to real estate agents, um, and again, I'm just using this as an example, mm -hmm. and you meet somebody who owns a title company, if they're not a good prospect for you, but they know tons of realtors, then, you know, offer to take that person to lunch. Hey, I would love to, maybe I can come in and do a presentation, you know, one day. Uh, and you can invite all of your, the realtors that you work with. Um, you know, would you be interested in doing, you know, co-hosting an event? You know, find a way to work with those people that could be a good strategic partner for you. Mm -hmm. um, find a way to carry on that conversation. And if you don't hear back from them right away, you know, send them an email, but then definitely pick up the phone and call them. You've got to, you know, get used to using the phone, talking to them. Let them hear your voice. And again, they're going to tell you more things than they would in an email. Mm -hmm. An email is usually going to be a quick response. Yeah, I enjoyed meeting you too. Hey, Monday at three works best. And that's mm -hmm. all you're going to hear. 
Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you're, you know, getting more detailed information. And what I used to, and again, uh, people are probably sick of me saying this. I'm very old school. And what I do with business cards, some people bring them back and they enter them into their Salesforce database or enter them into Excel. And if you like doing things online, keep it online. By all means, do that. Scan Mm -hmm. the card in, whatever you feel like you need to do. I am more old school. I go to the dollar store and I will buy those little fat notebooks that the kids used to put their homework in, you know, Mm -hmm. write down homework assignments. Mm -hmm. And I staple a business card to the top of the page and I handwrite my notes. Mm -hmm. 218, email Joe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 219, had coffee with Joe. And, but I like to do it that way. That's just me. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's no Mm -hmm. reason, you know, if you're strapped and you're on a budget, don't go all out. I mean, if you still mm-hmm. want to do it electronically, fine. Go to Zo, do Zoho, do uh, Constant Contact, do uh, you know something that's low cost. Do Excel, do do whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Do Outlook. I mean, you could do stuff in Outlook now. That's you know, if you're more tech savvy and you feel more comfortable having it online, then by all means do that. Mm-hmm. But find a way to keep the information all together. Um, another reason why I like to handwrite things is because our computers crash. I mean, you know. I still have notebooks. I pulled some out the other day from 2008 mm-hmm. of some people. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I wonder how this person's doing, you know, just right. to reconnect with some of these people. Mm-hmm. So I like doing it that way. But, again, that's just me. So find a way that's comfortable to you to keep mm-hmm. track of those prospects. And then the most important thing that you have to do is to continually touch base with them. Um, I've told this story several times when I've been interviewed about a prospect that I had that I pursued for two years Mm -hmm. and they became one of my biggest marketing clients, but it, most people would give up after the eighth time that they reached out and I didn't, I continually kept that relationship alive and reached out to them and, and went back and looked at my notes. Okay. It's been a month or I told this person I would follow up with them in two months. And I put a note on my calendar to do that. Um, consistent follow-up is the key. So if you have, you got to have a system you're comfortable with, and then mm-hmm. you have to actually do the work of following up. Mm-hmm. And how much follow-up is too much? Well, going back to, you know, the story that I have, the client that it took me two years to get, What I was doing is they were starting their own business and they would tell me, we want you to do our marketing. Okay, great. And they were located in Washington and I'm here in Florida. So uh, I just said, you know, when I had the initial conversation with them, I said, when do you all think you'll be ready? They're all probably about 90 days. Okay, great. Can I follow up with you in 90 days? Sure, that would be great. Okay, I'll Mm -hmm. give you a call. Now, actual follow-up is when you have a conversation with that person. They're responding Mm -hmm. back to you. Don't feel like you reaching out to them and you get their voicemail or you reaching out to them with an email and they don't respond. That's part of the process, but that's not true follow-up. True Mm -hmm. follow-up is I followed up with this person and I have an end result of what to do next. Mm -hmm. So in 90 days, I followed up with them. Oh, my gosh, Carrie, thanks for following up. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be another six months. We haven't gotten all of our funding yet. Okay, great. Is it okay if I follow up with you? in six months, I'll, I'll reach out, you know, in November and I made notes and in the interim, because that was a longer period of time, I connected with this person on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Um, I followed them on Twitter. Um, if I saw an article that I thought was interesting, I would forward it to them and I would say nothing about follow up. I'd be like, Hey, you know, hope you're doing great. I saw this article, thought of you, thought you, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it's, you know, in line with what you're doing. And you know, enjoy the rest of your week. Mm -hmm. And I would send it off just to keep my name in front, to be at the forefront. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So six months comes and goes. I call. I finally get them on the phone. It took about another three or four weeks before I got them on the phone. Oh, Carrie, you know, we still, we're still waiting on our funding and it looks like I'm going to be at my job for another year. Blah blah. So it's like, okay, I'm going to follow up in another six months. And Mm -hmm. I did the same process. I still reached out to them with information I thought would be valuable to them. And it was on different things. One time I sent them an article about open office space that was in their area and about, you know, here's a new up and coming area of town. Mm -hmm. You know, don't know if you've seen this, but it looks like they've got really good prices. You might just want to print this out, keep it for future reference said nothing to them, followed up in another six months. It took a couple of months or a couple of weeks to get them on the phone again and have Mm -hmm. an actual conversation. When they were finally ready to move forward, they actually reached out to me. 
we were waiting in that other six month time period, about three months into it, they called me and said, we are ready to move forward. And they said, one of the things that they said to me, they said, we want you to know the reason we're moving forward with you is because you have been so consistent and you have done everything that you said you were going to do. Mm. When you told me you were going to call, you called, mm-hmm. you followed up, you did, mm-hmm. you know, and that's what we need with our marketing efforts. And they became actually one of my biggest clients that I had when I did marketing. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, had I not done that, and again, a lot of people would have given up. And I actually got referrals from them, too, you know, in addition to that. Right. But you have to keep the door open. You've got if, if they're in your funnel and they're the only time you should ever stop calling is if they tell you don't call me anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. And even at that point, what I do with those leads, if it's a if it's a company, Mm -hmm. I put them in a file folder. I have a red file folder and I put them in there. And I what I do is I mark the date that they told me that. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I call back in like in another six months because anymore people have such high turnover at companies. Mm -hmm. So I'll call Mm -hmm. in. And if it's Joe Smith that I talked to before. Hi, is, mm-hmm. you know, just is Joe Smith available? Oh, I'm mm-hmm. sorry. He's not with the company any longer mm-hmm. because nine times out of 10 within a six month time period, that person's probably going to be gone anyway. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Who took, you know, do you have somebody that's taken right. their place? I mm-hmm. do. It's Karen so-and-so. Let me transfer you over. So now I have a brand new contact and mm-hmm. I can reopen that lead. Mm, that's because just because yeah. Joe wasn't interested anymore doesn't mean Karen doesn't know about the conversations I've had with Joe. Right. She has no clue. Mm-hmm. So it's a brand new lead with a company I've been trying to work with. Mm-hmm. So I now if, if I would have called in, they said, oh, yeah, just one moment. I would have hung up when they transferred me and marked <laughs> another six months. Because one thing that this marketing has taught me is that there's a lot of turnover with mm-hmm. companies mm-hmm. and you can do that. You can. That's a good way of recycling a lead. So it's too much follow up when they tell you not to call anymore. Mm-hmm. But anytime you call and you talk to somebody and they say, look, it's not the right time or I just don't have the money right now. You, it is your job to, to do the next step in the follow up process, which is to say, Hey, how about if I follow up in another month or two or just see where you're at in six months? Would that be okay? Mm-hmm. And if they say, mm-hmm. no, I don't want you to call me. Okay, fine. You just move on to the next one. Mm-hmm. But if they say, yeah, why don't you reach out to me again another six months? We'll see where we're at. So, you know, you can follow up with that person. And now during that time frame, you still want to be, you know, make a connection with them on social media or send them an article or like their post or comment on their post, you know, still be there, have your name in front of them, but not mm-hmm. saying, Hey, you know, did you change your mind yet? Or right. you, know, you just want to mm-hmm. have, you just want to be at the forefront. Mm-hmm. So it's too much when they tell you, don't call me anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and to be honest with you, you're really not going to have a lot of that. People think that they're going to have a lot of that, but they mm-hmm. don't. Mm-hmm. If you do this correctly. So what about the situation where you may have someone who um, shows interest, but they seem not to be taking that next step or they keep saying, well, it'll be, I, I don't know yet, or I'll know in a week and I'll know in another two weeks, I'll know in another three weeks. Um, is that, is that where you look at the, what, what, what they call overcoming resistance or is there something else going well, on there? There's two different things there. If you have someone who says who's waiting on funding and this happens a lot in B2B, if you have someone who's waiting on funding and they say, Oh, you know, give me another two weeks or, you know, definitely take their word for it and follow up in another two weeks or follow, you know, and then if they tell me, you know, another three weeks or whatever, I'll be like, okay, you know, and, if they keep telling you that and it's like two weeks turns to into another three and another four, you know, at that point, you definitely want to do a little bit more probing and say, there's, you know, is that normal in your process? And if they say no, then you want to ask them, well, you know, is someone new and chart, you know, you sometimes they'll tell you, Hey, look, we've got a new process in, in funding or we have a new process in our vendor process or we're new using new software and it's creating problems. You need to probe a little bit more because if they're, if they tell you another four weeks, you might want to say, look, why don't I give you a call back in six weeks? You know, give them uh, some extra time. And if something changes in the interim, call me before then, but just know I'm going to call you in six weeks on the 19th or whatever to follow mm-hmm. up. You know, add a little bit of time to it. Um, now, if they're telling you, oh, I just don't know, or, you know, if they tell you they don't know, or I just don't know if I can get the money, or I don't know if um, the timing is right, 
you know, if those are more objections that can be overcome. And what I usually do with those in the follow up process is I just come right out with it and I tell them, what is it exactly that's that's holding you back? If if they talk about money, just say, well, if, if it's just a question of money that's holding you back, would a payment plan work for you? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, what could you fit into your budget? Let me see what I can do to work with you. Now, clearly, you and I, we own our own company, so we can make, we can alter those. Now, if you're working for a uh, a big company, you might have a couple of options, or you might have to go back to your boss and say, hey, what can we do to work with this client? They really mm-hmm. want to work with us. And you might be able to come up with some other options. Um, but you have to probe. You've got to ask and just say, if it is it if it was only a question of money, would you go forward with it today? And if they Mm -hmm. say yes, okay, well, what exactly is it that's holding you back? If it's the price, would a payment plan work for you? Or maybe we can get you into a cheaper plan. Or maybe we can, you know, you have to kind of, you know, again, this is where the selling process comes in and the, you know, a funnel's not going to help you. You're going to have to sit down and figure out a a way to work with this client Mm -hmm. or potential client. If they talk about timing, you know, sometimes there's nothing you can do about timing. It's just like, you know, a wedding planner. Mm -hmm. Oh, the timing's not right. We haven't set a date yet. Well, you can't force that. There, there's two people that are involved in that that have to set a date. Mm -hmm. And if the timing isn't right, that wedding may never take place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, same thing with hiring people. If somebody says, Oh, the timing's not right. Well, it could be, you know, budget cuts. It could be a lot of different things with timing. That's a little bit more, but again, you've got to ask questions, you know, Mm -hmm. well, what is it exactly with the timing? Is it, do you think you're going to be hiring? Is it, is, are you waiting on a new project or, or funding to come through? Are there new clients that are you're onboarding? You know, you've got to probe and ask questions. Mm-hmm. Um, if they talk, so that's timing, money. If they talk about, well, I just don't know if I'm interested, that usually nine times out of ten is a money issue. And mm. you have to flat out ask people when they tell you that, mm-hmm. what part is it that that is of that you're really not interested in or, or what interests you the most about this? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and usually they'll tell you, well, I'm really interested in, I like this aspect, but I don't, and, and you just, you've got to ask questions. Mm-hmm. Um, people, mm-hmm. one thing that you have to learn with the sales process is a lot of components are, when you're dealing with people, it comes down to human nature. Mm-hmm. And I can say, it's cold outside. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I can put on a jacket and you could be in the same room with me and go, it's cold outside. And you walk outside and you're like, oh, my gosh, this is shorts weather. I'm taking my jacket <laughs> off. Everybody has a different reaction to and, and a different viewpoint of mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. And you, ha- mm-hmm. your job in the sales process is to get on their wavelength, try to figure out how they're thinking. What are they thinking about? Because what could be, you know, even though you can come up with a payment plan, that may not be okay for them. Mm -hmm. That may still be a problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes money issues, it's just not the right client because they can't afford your product. Sure. But they're not going to come out and tell you that. But you got to probe, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, you Mm -hmm. have to ask questions. That's very true. That's a good point. They're not going to tell you because I've had things where I was selling, um, um, my freelance writing and I may quote someone, you know, they may go on and on about what they want and they're asking me how much it is and then I tell them and then usually it's, oh, that sounds fair. And you know, I always know from their reaction that that was more than they were expecting. And <laughs> so mm-hmm. I like, I could just tell from that, you know, cause a lot of times if that person does want that service, they're going to go to the next step. Because now we were at the point where you're saying, well, this is what you want. This is what I can provide. Mm-hmm. This is how much it is. And if that's yeah. their comeback, chances are they weren't trying to pay that kind of money. You now they're looking for an exit. So I really don't press them at that point because I know that they're, I'm not going to discount for them. When I had gotten a couple of things on LinkedIn, ProFinder to, to do this executive resume, I talked to her on the phone and, and told, you know, asked her questions, took a look at, at her resume, you know, said what I could do, my procedure and what the, you know, the rates were. And then I stepped back. I sent her the information. I knew that there were other people who also bid, like I think five bids happened. And I don't know who else she talked to, but I just wanted to listen to what she said, 
say, this is how I could solve your problem, but I'm not going to be overbearing to you. At least that's how I did it. I'm not going to try to get you to say yes at this second. I'm going to show you what I could do and that I'm professional and how I'm going to do this. And then I also uh, sent her a contract as my way of saying, now you're protected and so am I, because I'm telling you what I heard you say, and this is what I'm saying is covered by that. So to me, that was a way for me to say, yes, you're, you're paying for this service. This is what you're getting. And this is why, even though you just met me, you know, we're on LinkedIn, but you just in a sense met me. This is how, why I feel you can trust me to deliver this to you. You know, so that's how in those circumstances that you could say it's online, but I don't look at that necessarily as an online thing because it wasn't through, a, it was, you know, we were talking and interacting and for that kind of work, you really have to make that connection with the person. And so I met her at a networking event, you know, in a sense, that's what that is. Um, you know, so I had, I handled it in that way to let her know. And I mean, if she had any questions about that. I sure would have answered them, mm-hmm. but that was my way of just letting her know where I stood, where I stood, that I heard her and this is how I could solve her problems. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I, I kind of worked that way when it comes to that kind of, um, service that I deliver. Exactly. And that's the only way that you really can do it. Because like I said, it's, you know, the funnels and the online marketing, it's great for bringing in leads. But at some point, you are going to have to have a conversation. You're going to have to customize. Um, You're going to have to I mean, when you overcome objections, you're going to each one's going to be different. Everybody's situation's different. Their money situation's different. Every company's different. You're you're just gonna have to probe and ask questions and and uh, get involved in the selling process. Mm-hmm. And what do you what do you say about you know the situations? I'm sure a lot of people have been in where they've had someone who they've met and they're meeting with again or, or whatever, and the person is just trying to get that sale right now. If you're meeting, so the flip side of that is if so basically you're talking about if someone is trying to sell to you. Well, I guess. Yeah. That's been my, that's been my experience, like on the other end, <laughs> where the person's like insistent. And I guess from a sales point of view, maybe this, I should ask the question a little differently. Um, how can that be handled better? Because sometimes mm-hmm. that's so overbearing, it chases you away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's someone who really isn't, um, customizing really isn't involved in the sales process. They think they are, but they're not. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm all for closing, but you have to, you know, you need to be pleasantly persistent, but if someone's not ready, you can't get blood from a turnip. They're, they're not ready. They're not ready. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so if you're not being involved in that process with them, it's just not going to work. Now there's, I think there's two things with this. I mean, number one, you know, I've had it where we've, we've all done this, where we've gone to networking events. We have someone that we feel would be a good strategic partner for us or someone who could make a good client for us. And we go and we meet and we have lunch and we do a presentation or, you know, they're in, they show some interest in our product. Um, and we, you know, go through the presentation and then we just kind of go in for a close immediately. And, you know, to me, I'm, I've never been, really comfortable with that on the first go round, but it's always been more business to business. But even now that I'm more on selling on the individual side with pageantry, it's the same thing. I, what I do is, you know, I would do a presentation and, you know, from a business to business standpoint, I would just say, you know, if I wanted to really get an idea, because if they seemed really interested, I would say, you know, on a scale of one to 10, what's your interest level? 10, you're ready to sign up today. One, you have no interest at all. Where are you at? And most people would say, you know, seven, eight, nine. And, you know, and then I would say, okay, well, what would it take to get you from a seven to a 10? Well, I need to go back and get approval. You know, you got to find out where they're at. So, um, you know, again, that that goes back to probing. Now, with individual, what I've done is I've laid out, you know, three different options for them. You know, meaning the working with me one on one is the best option. And here's a here's another good option that's, you know, a little bit less of my time. Um, or this last option is more of a do it yourself model, which 
which one do you, why don't you review all of these and I'm going to give you a call back tomorrow or let's, let's talk tomorrow, um, you know, and see where you're at. And sometimes when I do that, people will say, well, I think I'm, I'm here and, and they're kind of, they're ready to go at that mm-hmm. point. They want to sign up. Um, but you have to give them a moment to digest that information. Mm-hmm. You know, there's mm-hmm. only really two industries that do well with that one, one stop shop close. Timeshare mm-hmm. is one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, unless you're a timeshare salesperson, I don't think you should do that approach. Um, or, <laughs> or in the other one would be in the automobile industry because they know that once the person walks off the car lot, they're 90% chance they're not coming back. Mm-hmm. So yeah, unless you're in those two industries, I would say stay away from that type of close. Um, if you have someone that's pushing you like that, and I, we've all had it happen where we've met someone at a networking function, we go have coffee and they're selling you. They're mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, mm-hmm. you, you should do this and sign mm-hmm. up and can I follow up with you tomorrow? And they're, and what I usually do at that point, especially if I, I look at it two different ways. If they're selling to me and they're pushing really hard, let's just say it's a, um, um, you know, if it's someone that's going to be a complimenting, you know, uh, product or service to my business that we're basically, it's a good strategic partner. We're going after the same type of client. Um, but, uh, you know, you would logistically want to try to salvage that relationship and just say, you know, sometimes you just have to say, hey, look, you know, I, I appreciate that. I don't think I'm not a good fit for this, but obviously we're after the same clientele. Um Let's do some, how would you feel about doing some events together? Why don't we try to share leads? Why don't mm-hmm. we, you know, find a way mm-hmm. to work with them? But if they're still adamant to get you to sign up or they want you to sell their product or service, then you might want to say, okay, probably it's clearly it's not a good fit. You know, if I see of anyone, I'll let, you know, send them your way mm-hmm. and just get out of there as quickly as possible. And then the other part of it could be that if they're, they're trying to sell something to you and they're really doing a hard close, they want, you know, you'd be great at this. You, you know, why don't you, or this would be so beneficial to your business. And you're like, you could always just be honest and say, you know, look, I wouldn't mind doing this, but maybe in a year, mm-hmm. um, or I'm just getting started, you know, just, I, I think brutal honesty is the best way to combat that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And like I said, I think we all do that. A lot of people come to, especially with networking contacts, mm-hmm. everybody thinks, but it's the same thing. If you're a realtor and you're meeting with somebody that rents an apartment, if they're not ready to buy, mm. they're not ready to buy. Right. And, you know, you still have to put them through the qualifying process. They have to be pre-approved. You know, do they have a mortgage broker? Um, they might have to clean up their credit. That could take a year, mm-hmm. you know, so pushing, you know, and just being pleasantly persistent and saying, Hey, that's why you need to have a, this to me is really where a true funnel comes in mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. as you're putting those leads in there, some of them are going to fall through the funnel pretty quickly within mm-hmm. the next six months. And some of them are going to fall through real lightly like a feather and it might take a year to get mm-hmm. through the whole funnel process. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it, you know, you have to see where, pe- where people are at, meet them where they are, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. trying to drag them to where you want them to be is a great way to scare them off and also a great way to make sure that they never do business with you. <laughs> Yeah, I think that happens much too often, which probably gives sales a bad name um, because you're encountering that kind of pressure um, from people. And that's what makes people feel like, oh, that's what I have to do in order to sell. And that uh, that's not true. It's just their particular style or maybe they just really don't know how to do it properly. Um, or maybe that's worked for them <laughs> in the past. So they're going to try that with everybody, but it doesn't mean that's what you have to do. Hi, everyone. We'll be right back after this short commercial break. Hi, this is Deborah. Not only am I host of Women Entrepreneurs Radio, but I'm also a writer and coach. I've learned that making professional changes calls for a change in mindset, and that's not always easy to do. In my book, Think Like an Entrepreneur, Transforming Your Career and Taking Charge of Your Life, you'll learn the five steps to thinking like an entrepreneur so that you can move from idea to action. You'll also get information on how to manage fear of failure and how to banish self-doubt. And you'll receive lots of motivation to pick you up and point you in the right direction 
when you're facing the emotional and mental challenges that come with making life changes. In fact, one reviewer said, the book gave me ideas to match with my own feelings. This book is clear, straightforward. All tips are really good and easy to apply. I couldn't agree more. So get your copy today of Think Like an Entrepreneur, Transforming Your Career and Taking Charge of Your Life. It's available in print, ebook, and audiobook on Amazon.com. Regarding networking and you're in person and meeting people, what should a person really be looking at? Should they be looking at someone who they can possibly sell to at some point or looking for someone they can make into a contact? What, what should people have in mind when they are going to these kinds of events? Well, a couple of different things, especially with networking. I find that there's, there's four, I, I call them the four E's. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's four elements to it. And I, you know, again, I think going into it, everybody needs to take this into consideration. Mm-hmm. You know, with networking, there, the four E's are education, experience, expectation, and execution. So when it comes to networking, everyone's education level with networking is different. Some people are a total novice. They've never done it before. Some people have taken a class on how to network effectively. And some people have been doing it so long, they consider themselves a networking pro. Mm-hmm. Um, so or they might even teach classes on networking. So coming into it, just realize everyone's education level is different. Their experience is different. You know, again, this might be someone's first networking event. The next person you meet, this might be their 259th networking event that they've attended. Mm -hmm. So, and they might have attended a lot of different types of events and their experience level is much higher than than others Mm -hmm. and the third thing is is everyone's expectations are different some people come to a networking event and and it's still true to this day they come in and they think everybody's going to flock over to as soon as i walk in the every there's going to be a hush over the room everybody's going to (laughs) turn and look at me run over and say where have you been all my life? This is the product or service that's going to change everything. Why haven't I met you before? And everybody's going to want their business card and everybody, they're going to be, their appointment book's going to be filled for the next six months. And that's all, that's all she wrote. <laughs> and there are, you'd be surprised. It's the same thing with, with vendors and exhibitors that mm-hmm. think, Oh, all I have to do is set this up and people will come by and where have you been all my life? And that's all there's going to be to it. Mm-hmm. So everyone's expectations are different. And then most people, I think this is where most people's opinions are skewed and where a lot of trouble starts is because again, the expectations are different. You know, some mm-hmm. people think, well, I paid $10 to come to this event. I should have at least met, you know, 10 new right. customers. Mm-hmm. And it just mm-hmm. doesn't work that way. You're there to make connections. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're there mm-hmm. to make connections. So, Keep in mind, everyone's expectations are different. And then lastly, their execution, how they network is different. Mm -hmm. You go to some networking events and you have the one person who's, you know, schmoozing and talking to everybody and handing out their business cards and call me next week, we'll have lunch or let's go play golf. And, you know, they're talking to everybody in the room and they're collecting all the cards and Mm -hmm. then they leave. Then you have some people that are total wallflowers. They're not talking to anybody. They've got a frown on their face. Nobody's approaching (laughs) them and they're standing there going why isn't anybody talking to me you know um and then you have some people who come in and they're like oh they're talking to a few people um you know so everyone's execution of how that's also another thing that will really affect you so to run through these very quickly education you know if you can read a book on networking that would be great it's all about building relationships mm-hmm. okay at mm-hmm. the end of the day your experience the more experience you have the easier it is for you um you know go to some networking events over lunch and always sit next to people you don't know mm-hmm. uh, that's what i tell everybody sit next to somebody you don't know and have a conversation with them learn about them you know, don't feel like you got to meet everybody in the room. Mm-hmm. If you walk away meeting five or six people, that's a, that to me is a huge success. Mm-hmm. You know, cause you mm-hmm. met five or six people you wouldn't have otherwise met. Right. Um, you know, and your expectations, you should go with the expectation of meeting people. Mm-hmm. That should be your only expectation. Mm-hmm. Not to make sales. Uh, if you do, great icing on the cake, but you're there to meet people. Right. And then your execution, you should you should be the one, have enough courage to 
go up and introduce yourself to other people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mingle around, talk with different people. Um, ask to be introduced. Usually most of these events have a host or have someone else and just say, hey, you know, I've never met so-and-so. Do you know them? Oh, do you mind introducing me? People have no problem. I've done this before. When I hosted events, I would, if I saw somebody at the door that was being really timid, mm -hmm. I immediately walked up to them. Hi, how are mm -hmm. you doing? I'm Carrie Heaps. I host this event. I'm so glad you're here. You know, what's your business about? Tell me about mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Get them talking. Oh, really great. And I, st I will take them by the hand and introduce them to different people mm -hmm. because sometimes people need a little push. Yeah. Um, and you never know. Sometimes people who are timid at a networking function, usually that means they're a decision maker of mm. some type. That's what mm -hmm. I find. Mm -hmm. So by helping them, you know, even if you're just there, you know, walk up to the person that just came in. Hey, how are you tonight? You know, you've got to be a little bit more outgoing. Your execution, mm -hmm. you need to introduce yourself to different people. Right. I came up with four questions that I call the look to your left questions. And mm -hmm. I came up with them for the simple fact of when I went to a new lunch event uh, or a dinner event, I sat next to somebody on my left that I didn't know purposely mm -hmm. every time. And I over lunch or dinner, I would get to know them. And, you know, and I would ask them, you know, so tell me about your business. Mm -hmm. was one of the questions I would ask. What do you do? Mm -hmm. And then I would ask them, who's a good strategic partner for you? You know, mm -hmm. find out who they were looking to meet. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, you know, let me tell you a little bit about my client base. And, and why don't you tell me if any of these people sound like they would make, you know, would it be a good introduction for you? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, you know, and at the time, if I, I was doing networking, I was doing marketing. So I would say, you know, I'm mostly interact with business owners, business to business uh, in this area, you know, mostly accountants, insurance people, you know, and then they would say, oh, you know, I love meeting with insurance people. OK, great. I have a couple of people I might be able to introduce you to then, you know, and I would be jotting all this down on the back of their business card. And then the last thing I would say is, you know, tell me, what are some of the primary situations that people or businesses are in that make them a good prospect for you? Are they filing for bankruptcy? Are they getting married? Are they buying a home? Are they getting retired? Are they retiring? Are they relocating? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. tell me what are, what's a good situation. And by doing this, by asking some of these questions, like especially when you tell them, let me tell you a little bit about my client base. Mm -hmm. Tell me who do you think, would any of these people, would this be a good introduction for you? And if they say, oh, yeah, you know, insurance agents, I, that's actually my primary focus. Okay, great. There's a, an immediate collaboration for you mm -hmm. to work with them. And then I would always make it a point to say, I would love for us to get together. Why don't we, I can get some leads and referrals. You know, if you have some insurance agents that I could meet with, that would be great too. You know, if you can, oh yeah. And because people, once you start helping them, when you open the door to start helping them mm -hmm. and not everybody does this, but mm -hmm. so sometimes you have to ask because they don't think about helping the other person, not because they're selfish. They just don't think to ask because right. their experience, their education and experience level with networking is different than yours. Mm -hmm. So open up mm -hmm. that door and say, hey, I have some insurance agents I can introduce you to. Maybe do you have if you're primarily working with them, I would love to, you know, talk to you about some of the people you're doing business with. Mm hmm. Because mm -hmm. standard rule, you should not be taking referrals from someone or leads from someone that you would not be willing to share yours with as well. Mm. It's kind of like say it's, it, this is a the dirty underwear concept, and this is this sounds awful, but it's true. Yes, it does. You should not be showing anyone your dirty underwear that you wouldn't be willing to look at theirs too. Oh my god! Yeah. So you can't say, oh, my God, you can't be talking with someone and say, hey, can I show you my dirty underwear? Okay. And if they say, I know, if they say, uh, okay, yeah, I'd like to see your dirty underwear. And you hit, pull it up and you show them your underwear. You have to be ready and willing to show them yours as well. Oh, my God. The image of that, Karen. <laughs> That's the best example I can give because a lot of people tell me that. They'll say, well, you know, I've done that, and I've, I've helped people at networking events, and I've made introductions, but they never make any introductions for me. My first question to that person is, well, did you ask them mm. to introduce you? Well, no. 
Okay, well, then that's your fault because their education and experience level are probably different. You're probably more advanced than they are. So you need to guide them. You need to coach them and say, hey, last week I gave you a couple of contacts with insurance agents. You know, how's that working out for you? Okay, great. Listen, I know you said that insurance agents are a good contact for you. Do you have a couple, because I'm I'm really looking to meet some new insurance agents as well. Do you have a few you can introduce to me? Mm. And a good rule of thumb, if you do that, and at that point, if they say, well, you know, I, you know, if they say, well, I really like to get to know somebody better first, that's where the dirty underwear concept comes in. I, they, I showed you mine, now show me yours. <laughs> oh, that image just won't leave me anytime soon. I know. I and you. I think I'm going to put it on Facebook. The dirty, <laughs> I should, I'm going to think I'm going to write, now that we're talking about this, I think I'm going to write an article about that. Dirty underwear. Well, that'll certainly get you some clicks. <laughs> the dirty underwear concept. The dirty underwear concept. Oh, my yes. God. But, but it's true. But think about that, Deb. Think about that. If I called you and said, you know, hey, Deb, I'm really looking to, uh, you know, because I've changed some things up now. I'm working in the pageant industry more. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm looking for some pageant directors. I know that you said you've coached a couple. You know, Mm -hmm. a few. there's quite a few in your area, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Can I uh, could you do some intros for me? And you say, sure, I can. And you make those introductions. And I don't say to you, well, let me know what I can do to help you or how can, you know, if you, if somebody helps you, it's just like the the dirty underwear concept is funny, but it's the same thing. Like when I open up the door for you at the grocery store, Mm -hmm. I hold it Mm -hmm. open for you and Mm -hmm. you say you're the immediate thing that you should be saying is thank you. And then I say, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the same concept. It's just, it's a, it's kind of a, you know, if I help you, you should be willing to help me. Now, what I will say to you is if you do have people who are like, well, you know, I really would like to get to know you better and I've already given you leads, Mm -hmm. then at the I usually don't dump people, but that would be somebody I would dump because if they're, if they're going to take help from you, but they're not willing to help you in return, that's not going to be a good business relationship. And nine times out of 10, those types of people will never follow up with the people. They're, they're not going to be good in the sales process. They may not even deliver good customer service. So those are the people who are what I would call out for themselves and they don't help anybody. Mm-hmm. So it's usually yeah. it'll happen once and never again. You just, yeah. and those are the people that will in another six months, they're going to run to you for more referrals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's a yeah. good way I look at it. Absolutely. So. It mm-hmm. is. So, I mean, you have to, you know, again, if you're willing to take, you need to be willing to give. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a, it's a push pull. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. an automatic thank you. You're welcome. Please. Mm-hmm. And thank you. Mm-hmm. It, it should go hand in hand. If you're not willing to help me, you shouldn't be willing to accept my help either. Mm. I think that's an excellent point to make because as we and know, and that's where I came up with the whole dirty underwear concept. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah, my, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I'll let you write that quote. I will, and I will. I'll let you write and then that. we'll see if anybody, any of my uh, uh, media outlets publish it. <laughs> oh no, but that, that really is so true because people, and, and you know, as we know, um, in person and also like online, like if you feel like a LinkedIn or something, where people will be contacting you mm-hmm. um, and say, oh, hey, look at this thing I just made. And they just connected with you five minutes ago. Right. <laughs> and I'll be honest, you know, to me, that kind of stuff doesn't really bother me. Now, there was somebody the other day that put something on Facebook, and it was like a 10-minute, it must have took her 10, 15 minutes to write it, mm-hmm. and talking about, you know, you people who are in direct sales, you know, you'll make friends with me, and then five minutes later, you're sending me an email about joining your team or about your product or your service. And mm-hmm. I, if I if I see it in your news feed and I'm interested, I'll reach out to you. And I don't like it when people do that to me. And, and I mean, going on and on and on, okay, fine. Um, but to me, it's kind of, you know, people are going to sell to you. And, mm-hmm, and again, mm-hmm, it, it goes back to mm-hmm, what I said before. Everyone's mm-hmm. education, experience, um, their expectations mm-hmm. and their execution, they're all going to be different. Nobody's ever going to be on the same page as you. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be people that you will offend. But like I said, I had one person that this, this happened to me with who was in an insurance agent who – 
you know, I helped and, but I made it very clear. I said, I'm, I'm doing this to help you, but please understand this is how I make my living. Mm. So if you want to do this moving forward, here are some options for you, pricing options, so forth. Well, okay, great. Never heard anything else from her. Six months later, she's asking me for help. Mm. And I just kind of said, well, you know, nice to hear from you. And, you know, we're going to be having a sale soon, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so then there came a time when I was actually looking for help from her, you know, for some referrals. Mm -hmm. And she actually had the audacity to say to me, well, I really don't like to make referrals unless I really know more about the product or service that you're offering. And then at that point, I'm like, okay. This, I cut that business relationship <laughs> off. She's it. not even in my database anymore. No. Because again, it. this is someone that I've helped twice. Okay. Mm-hmm. This and and you mm-hmm. you'll be able to pick up on those people mm-hmm. if they're only in it to help themselves and they're not mm-hmm. willing to help you. Right. You know, you can't be willing to. Like I said, if I just met someone at a networking event and I'm willing to make introductions for them mm-hmm. and they're willing to take them and do business with them, then mm-hmm. they need to be willing to give some to me. Right. That's true. And if they're not, then they shouldn't be taking it. it it's it's kind of like a, um, uh, you know, it, it's just a standard, you know, it, it people are there to make connections and it's to help one another. And if you're willing, if you're going to take, 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 and you're not going to be willing to give, um, then you shouldn't yeah. be taking. Don't take until you're ready to give. Well, I think for a lot of people, or I'm just going to say, I think it's, it's just what, what I call no home training. Mm-hmm. Um, they just don't know how to interact with people in a certain mm-hmm. way because they don't, either they don't have the personality for it. They weren't, they weren't taught. Um, how to do that or whatever. It maybe it's just the way they are as people in every area of their life that they're, they're takers. Um, they're not givers or they're not listeners. Um, because being a listener myself, mm-hmm. I know that a lot of people don't listen because when you, when you, um, have conversations with people and you really listen to them and how they, you know, I've had people tell me things that I, people I've just met like on the bus. <laughs> and they're telling me stuff about their life, and I'm like, my goodness, I could be writing all kinds of scandalous stories because I guess they connect with someone who's really listening to them, and then they mm-hmm. just start blurting out whatever. So I think listening is something that's really going to help you as a salesperson. Is you know, I'm going to say, I feel. Well- it, and it, you know. you're right, exactly. And it, again, it goes back to those four elements I talk about. And yeah. I think at some point, this is probably going to be my next book, is to talk about because mm-hmm. everyone's education level is different. Yes, everyone's experiences it. are different. And again, you have to coach them. And sometimes, mm-hmm. too, you might think, well, gosh, this person should know better. Well, not necessarily. No, if you're not no. asking, it's just it's being in a relationship. You're basically you're forming a relationship with this person. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing mm-hmm. when you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You know, it's just like... We as women are guilty of doing this where we feel like, well, my husband should know to I've had a hard day and that he should clean up the kitchen. That's the worst as opposed thing. To, yeah. And if you but if you go in there and say, look, I've had a really hard day. I have a headache. Could you please clean up the kitchen? Yes. I want to go lay down. You have to and then if they it. say, well, no, I've had a hard day, too, then you can take it from from there. But you they don't sometimes people aren't they're not thinking they haven't had the same experience. That you just right. Had. Right. You don't know and you to have ask. To, and I think that's just human nature that we approach all situations like that. Yeah, and I agree. Sales is is going to be no different. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. And I think I think that's the thing where if you're the type of person who has um, some sense of um, <laughs> self awareness and how you're dealing with people, that you would probably be very good with interactions because you you know you're listening, you're asking, which is something we also have to do is ask. Um, you're talking about people are asking for help or asking for a referral, asking. You just assume that they should volunteer because you're, you're just thinking, well, if I did this, they should do that. But mm-hmm. asking is always a good thing to do because you never know what you're going to get just by asking, <laughs> just mm-hmm. by letting people know that you could use their help. And you'll be very surprised in, in what you're getting back. But they don't know. They don't know that you need them. They don't know you're looking for that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people I've talked to on the show that um, 
you know, I reached out to him and said, Hey, you know, I've got, um, I have this book coaching and consulting because I, you know, I've done self publishing and, um, you know, if you're connected with someone who is looking to, to do an outline for their book or something, you know, this is for someone I've interviewed a couple of times and she already has books, but who knows who she's interacting with, who we've had a nice conversation. And I can say, you know, I've done this. I'm, I can help organize someone's outline, even if they're going to go and put that with a traditional publisher, help them get their ideas. And I just put that out to her. You know, mm-hmm. I'm saying that now she knows that that's something that I'm looking for or open to. She wouldn't have known otherwise. Right. Um, you know, so I just let let people know how they can help you. And then you can listen as to how, you know, if they ask you for a help or a referral then you're listening and you're like, okay, and this is how we can have this relationship um, as opposed to someone just telling you what they want from you, but not even knowing what you need Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the first place. I I just kind of think that with sales is is very much a reflection of of the people in their interactions and their communication styles. And that's, I think, you know, what you're saying, Carrie, is that, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody is, is different in that regard. And we make assumptions and we're reacting in certain ways based on what we think as opposed to really communicating and maybe finding out what that person needs and wants. And maybe it's not what you provide in the first place. Who knows? Mm-hmm. You know? Well, and I think, too, you know, there's so much out there about giving and receiving, giving, you know, be open to giving, be open to receiving. And, you know, you can't do one without the other. Somebody, if you give, somebody's got to receive and vice yeah. versa. And that's why I always say I go back to you should not be receiving something that you mm-hmm. wouldn't be willing to give in return. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a, it's kind of a common courtesy. And especially with networking um, and, and the sales aspect of it, because at the end of the day, people come to that's the ultimate goal. They want to make sales. They want to make connections. They want to. They're out there promoting their product, their service. And, you know, if someone's willing to help you and make connections, you should be willing to do the same. Mm -hmm. But sometimes Mm -hmm. it takes coaxing to get that. Because, again, mm-hmm. they just don't always see it. They're like, oh, well, this is great. This person's helping me. Wonderful. Right. Great. But nine times out of ten, I find when I say that to people, you know, um, let me tell you about my client base. And if I mm-hmm. start talking about insurance agents, nine times out of ten, they'll say, oh, my gosh, I deal with a lot of them, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of insurance mm-hmm. agents. And, mm-hmm. you know, so they kind of get to know what you're looking for, too. Mm -hmm. And if you do feel Mm -hmm. like, hey, I've got to get to know you better before I refer business to you, well, then you should feel that way, too. You shouldn't be taking my referrals, Mm -hmm. you know, Uh, because if you feel like you need to get to know me better, then, you know, that's that's kind of like saying, I mean, it's like, again, I just I go back to the dirty underwear concept, but Mm -hmm. you shouldn't be willing to take something you're not willing to replace at some point. Well, that's you know. true. That, that's, that is what it comes down to, I think. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, that's why I also think some of it may come down to, um, a person, you know, who they really are mm-hmm. <laughs> and how yeah. they communicate with other people. And, and if they look at you as someone they're getting something from, mm-hmm. or are they really looking at establishing an equal, um, partnership of some kind? Um, you know, and, and sometimes they're not looking for that. They're just looking for what they want in that moment. And that's all they, they are going to do is try to sell you that thing that they just met you five minutes ago. But they're not necessarily asking you how they can help you. Um, and I think, you know, we, we've encountered that a lot um, from people. And that, <coughs> unfortunately, I think that's part of what turns people off. It does. I mean, it, and it is, it's a, it's a part of the sale and this show is, you know, when we're talking about offline sales, but again, you know, networking is, and, and, you know, doing this in person yes. is a huge thing. Um, you know, it's just like when I worked in staffing, we, I would have some clients who are like, I would love to, you know, hire a few more people, but we just don't have the business. And mm-hmm. I went out of mm-hmm. my way to help them get appointments for potential clients for themselves, Mm -hmm. you know, which is above Mm -hmm. and beyond what I would normally do, but it paid off in the end because Mm -hmm. six months later they got two new contracts. So what did they Mm -hmm. do? They hired two new people Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I got that business. So, Mm -hmm. you know, again, you have to sometimes be willing to do above and beyond, but from the networking standpoint of sales, I do find that people, 
they do. They really will show their true colors. But I find the people who aren't willing to help you either a have no clue what they're doing mm. or they do know what they're doing and they're just being they just want to take. They have no mm. intention of ever giving back. Mm -hmm. And I find mm -hmm. those people don't stay in their chosen business long because they give off that vibe. Mm -hmm. They, you mm -hmm. know, people will pick up on, okay, they're only mm -hmm. here for themselves. Why even, you know, and it's, it's almost like a repellent and people right. pick up on it because they've had yeah. experiences with them. That's true. Yeah. And, you know, to me, I'm always willing to help someone once, but if they're not willing to help me in return and they continually come back because they want me to help them, that's mm -hmm. a problem. Yeah. You need to turn off. Yeah. You realize it's just very, um, it's very one-sided and mm -hmm. it's, it's what's the point of continuing, yeah. um, with something like that. So I totally agree. And, um, relationships know, have yeah. to be give and take and that networking sales side of things, it's the same thing. Yeah. You can't take, 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 take and never give anything to mm -hmm. that relationship. It's just mm -hmm. not going to work. So I'm always, be the bigger person, step up to the plate, help this person first. And mm -hmm. then, you know, they know how to help you, but you, sometimes you have to coach them through and mm -hmm. say, this is how you could help me. Could you get me an introduction? Mm -hmm. And if they're like, Oh yeah, sure. I'd love to do that. And then you never hear from them again. Well, you know, clearly that's not going to be right. a good that's partnership not gonna for help you. you. Move on. You know? Yeah. Just let that one go by. Carrie, okay, now we've covered this <laughs> this topic very much, and I think it's a, it's an excellent one in terms of how what people can learn about really making that sale. But um, you know, I had a question as far as closing goes, and I know a lot of times I fall into this pit myself, where I'm talking to someone and maybe I'm getting lost in what I'm talking about because I'm trying so hard to help them, but then I'm not closing the sale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, do you have any any thoughts on? how we can stay focused on what we're trying to do here and, and we can be helpful, but at the same time, we can also have, you know, close it down. Well, a couple of things. I mean, you know, you want to stay focused on what you're doing. If you're in that process where you're, wanting to close. I mean, there's a couple of different closing techniques that I recommend. If you're not comfortable with closing, I like the scale of one to 10 approach, which, you know, once you're done presenting whatever it is that you do, Mm -hmm. And, you know, ask them, you know, do you have any questions, you know, answer all of their questions. And then once you answer a question, just, you know, say, do you have any other questions? And, you know, once they say, well, no, I don't have any other questions. OK, great. Um, and then just say, you know, I'd like to ask you a question on a scale of one to ten. Where's your interest level? Meaning one, no interest at all. Ten, you're ready to get going today. Where's mm -hmm. your interest level? And they'll give you a number, um, you know, if they say five or six, um, you could say, OK, well, you know, five or below, I would say I would come back to them and say, OK, well, that tells me I probably haven't answered all of your questions. Um, you know what? Why would you say you're a five or, or below? And, you know, usually they're going to tell you, well, it could be something with money or it could be, well, I'd like to do this, but the timing is bad. You know, they're going to you got to start asking questions. Now, if they say six or above, you want to ask them, say, well, OK, that's great. Well, what would it take to get you from a six to a ten? Mm -hmm. What needs to happen to get you from a six to a 10? Mm -hmm. And usually they're going to tell you, um, well, you know, the pricing could be better or um, it could be I, I need I'm not ready to do this right now, but I will be. It, it's an issue of timing, you know, and then you can question accordingly. OK, well, if it's a question of money, which 90 percent of the time, that's what it comes down to for most people. Mm -hmm. But if it's a question of money, you could always say, OK, well, um, if you're not able to do that, you know, would it help you if we did a payment plan or would it help you to split up your payments? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you're able to do with negotiating. Mm. And they say, well, yeah, I think I could swing that. You know, I need to look at my finances. OK, great. Why don't you take a look at that tonight? How about I give you a call on Friday? Mm -hmm. How does that sound? Mm -hmm. OK, great. And then follow up with them on Friday and, mm -hmm. you know, let them know in the interim, you know, if you have to go back and check or get approval to do a payment arrangement, whatever, then then do that. Um, you know, you have to you. That's part of the closing process is you have to you got to ask for the sale. And the one to ten is a really good way to do it. Or you can flat out ask them, you know, are you ready to get started today? Mm -hmm. And they're either going to tell you yes or no. And then you can go into the questions of why or why not. Um, but you really 
you know, the one to 10 approach is really good. Um, and, but you have to ask them for the sale. What, what is it that we can do to get you started today? That's asking for the sale. Mm. Pull out the contract, mm -hmm. pull out your paperwork, whatever they have to do, um, your payment form, mm -hmm. get their information. Mm -hmm. And you could always tell them, you know, sometimes people, if you're able to take like a down payment, just say, okay, well, what, what could we do to get, you know, what could you do today just to secure your spot and pull mm -hmm. out that credit card form or whatever form that they have and don't leave there without their credit card information and just say, look, we'll do a hundred dollars today and then we'll do the rest on, on Monday or, or whatever, you know, whatever you work out with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's also a good way of doing it. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I would say if you're going to sit there and push them and push them and push them, you better, you're going to wind up probably lowering your price, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. that isn't always the best thing to do. But I always find that the one to 10 approach is the best one. Mm -hmm. It's being mm -hmm. pleasantly persistent. And, you you know, again, it's going to get you into what the real objections are. Yeah. And if they tell you, oh, you know, what would it take to get you to start today? If they're like, oh, well, you know, if you're if you're selling a product that's a thousand dollars and they say, well, I could do it for nine, you know, ninety nine dollars would be feasible for me. Then and they can't do a payment plan, then it's just clearly not a good client for you. You mm. know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I find some people who will continually lo you'll see them lower their price over time, over mm -hmm. six months or over a year because they're either they've priced it too high or they're marketing to the wrong people. I think that's that's great that you said that because the idea for a lot of um a lot of us um I'll certainly put myself in there is at times to just keep lowering the price and think, "Oh, I I've got to keep this person um and then I've got to just keep accommodating accommodating." A lot of times if you keep doing that, you still aren't going to get them. Um, mm -hmm. so, and there you are, um, selling this for much less than, than you really should. So I think it's, that's an excellent point for you to raise to say, well, maybe this really isn't your customer mm -hmm. and, and just face that. And, and sometimes too, I've, I've seen people who overprice their product, mm -hmm. you know, it might be a new mm -hmm. business starting out and, mm -hmm. you know, it, especially if they're brand new and let's, you know, it's like even like a CPA, mm -hmm. they might say, oh, well, you know, I'll do your taxes for, you know, $2,500. Mm -hmm. And I have a CPA who's been in business longer down the street that I already know that I know will do it for nine. Mm -hmm. You know, so it might be sometimes people need to adjust their pricing accordingly. That can be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I think everybody, you know, it, it falls back to what I say, the three E's, their education level, their experience, their expectation and their execution are all going to factor into this. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just like mm -hmm. with my pageant training, I know what people in the industry charge. Um, you know, I have been told I should raise my prices and knowing what I know and how long I've been in the industry, that's not the best idea. Um, you know, maybe mm -hmm. coming up with raising my price, but coming up with a better payment plan or coming up with something that would be kind of a long term thing for people to participate in where mm -hmm. over the long run I can make more money. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, coming out the door to say, you know, to do certain things for a certain amount of money is not going to be beneficial for, you know, for what I do. Mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. have to look at your customer base, you, you know, but again, that's for people who can determine their own pricing. Not everybody can do that. If you're working for a large company, mm -hmm. you got to play by their rules. I think that, you know, we'll probably come to the end of this because this is a topic we could definitely keep going on um, for sure, because it, there's a lot of good stuff to share here. But I just, um, you know, just had one more question Sure. Uh, for you is that a lot of times the way that maybe we're conditioned to believe is that to sell something we have to lie to people or we have to persuade them to do things and that isn't doesn't feel comfortable because we're not being honest um how would you address that you know because i think that's an objection i know i had in the beginning and there's can, still, you, can you give me an example I mean, like, say, when you hear people talk about overcoming objections, and sometimes mm -hmm. I think to myself as a buyer, mm -hmm. I have certain objections that I don't necessarily, I'm thinking when you're saying you're overcoming them, you're trying to force me to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like when you walk into a department store and they're spraying you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm 
going to spray you with this perfume. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, go, go away. So I guess how, how do we get to a point where we feel like we're not trying to force someone to do so? We can be honest about what we're doing, what we're selling, feel good about it, and not feel like we have to force them to do this now. Well, I think that comes, you know, when I talk about overcoming objections, that needs to be done after you do a presentation, after mm-hmm. you are, you have done your pitch. Mm-hmm. So if you're, if you're talking to somebody about pitching that, you know, about, hey, I'd love to talk with you about, you know, so you could learn a little bit more about, um, you know, let's just say even with cold calling, when we've cold called into businesses to say, we're trying to secure an appointment to do a presentation, you know, 10 minutes, um, and they're telling us, no, or we don't have time right now. Mm-hmm. Okay, I totally understand that. You know, you, we're going to try to overcome that objection and say, you know, could we give you a call back in six months or could we put something on the calendar for next month tentatively mm-hmm. or could we send you some information? And they're still saying no to even being pitched to, mm-hmm. then, yeah, then you need to move on. It's just like you you wish the spritzer girls would just say, hey, would you like to try our new scent? Right. And then they wait for your response, yes or no, yeah. and then they spray you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of the same thing. So overcoming objections, you're going to be doing that to do a presentation, but that mostly comes into play after you do a pitch mm-hmm. because clearly if they're willing to listen to you and to they want to learn more about what you're doing, there's some type of interest there. But in the beginning – you might just want to say, hey, I would, you know, love to talk with you about what I do. I'd love to learn a little bit more about what you do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, make it, make it again, going back to, I hate to keep using this example, but the dirty underwear concept. Mm-hmm. You can't be willing to, you can't force them to show you your underwear if you're not going to show them theirs. You know, you've mm-hmm. got to, you know, there needs to be something in it for them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so if you're trying to do, to get an opportunity to pitch to that person, you know, when I did sales for staffing, one of the things that we would do is we would send out um, fax surveys where I would fax the office and say, hey, I'd love to, you know, come by, introduce myself. Um, you know, could you fill out this little survey? And one of the questions I would have for them is, you know, are you looking to hire in the next six months? Yes or no. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to meet with you, you know, and, you know, your your sales team for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, does would does the early part of the week or later part of the week work better for your company, mornings or afternoons? Do you like donuts or do you like bagels better? Do you like Dunkin' Donuts or Einstein Brothers bagels better? Mm-hmm. I'll bring those to the meeting. So mm-hmm. there's something in it for, hey, free food, you know. <laughs> and that sounds silly because it had nothing to do with what we offered, but free food got me a lot of appointments to pitch. <laughs> so sometimes you have to say to people, hey, I'd love to tell you a little bit more about what I do. Can I buy you lunch? Can I take you to breakfast? Can I buy you some coffee? Let's meet at Starbucks. Starbucks, um, you know, sometimes just, you know, giving them an incentive to come and listen to you um, is part of that process um, because it might not be that you want to pitch to them, but you never know who they know. Mm-hmm. It's all about who they know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's pitching, right. to, you know, overcoming objections to do a pitch is one thing, but true overcoming objections is after you do your pitch, after they've listened to it, they've asked questions, mm-hmm. you've answered all their questions. Are you ready to go? That's really where the overcoming objection should come in. Mm-hmm. You know, if they don't want right. to listen to your pitch, you, you know, do one or two objections, then move on, go right. on to the next call. And that's it. And that's good. I'm, I'm, you know, just wanted to clear that up because I know for a lot of people, I know it has been that way for me as well. Um, you know, you get the wrong idea of what sales is and you think it's, I have to do all this underhanded stuff and I have to try to overcome that. You know, all the words that are used is so aggressive that I can understand why people get turned off. And yeah. And then by getting turned off, they're not doing what they could be doing to make the sale. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that's why I wanted to ask you about that because I, I this is this is all good stuff that we could all learn from and know how to be better and not feel like we're being aggressors um, against someone to get something from them or lying or be underhanded. That's not what it really is. Um, though I think you know, there's a lot of in the media maybe and and we've been conditioned to believe that selling is some kind of terrible thing. Um, you know, it really isn't, but you really have to look at it from a certain perspective. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's that's why I definitely want to get your opinion on that. So, Carrie, I know we've covered so much, but do you have any final thoughts or anything you want to summarize? 
Um, no, I would just say, you know, again, keeping it, just try to keep it simple, keep track of your process, keep track of your prospects, follow up, follow up, follow up, mm. you know, continue to follow up, but, you know, be pleasantly persistent. So, um, everyone, I know you've gotten a lot out of this. I know I have. Um, you know, like I said, I just wanted to kind of counter a lot of the negative perceptions that we may have about selling and the things that people are afraid of and feel they have to do uh, to make the sale, which really isn't true. But, you know, we need to really um, address it from a different way and understand that it doesn't have to be a negative thing um, at all. We don't have to do that in order to um, have a business. You really don't. So if that's something that's been bothering you, then I hope that this, um, you know, this has really helped you. And of course, you can apply a lot of these things, of course, to to online as well when you're interacting with people. It's not like this, you know, we had two, two different uh, shows. It doesn't mean that you can't take these lessons uh, into the other side as well. So I hope that you'll do that. So um, once again, this has been uh, Women Entrepreneurs Radio with your hosts, Deborah Bailey and Carrie Heaps. So glad you could join us, and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. You can also join in the conversation on Facebook.com slash Women Entrepreneurs and on the website, WomenEntrepreneurSecrets.com. And don't forget to listen in on dvcoach.podomatic.com and on iTunes.